Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello again. I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program which seeks to bring us understanding of God's Word, the Bible, and not only just understanding, but a closer relationship with Him. This is what our God wants of us. He wants us to know Him as well as He knows us. Certainly, we've got a lot of room to grow there. Let's begin now with a prayer, the prayer Jesus prayed for us and for all who believe in him. Jesus prayed, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you know to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Yesterday we heard Jesus pray that the full measure of his joy be with those who belong to him. He also prayed that because of the word he had given to his disciples, which they accepted, the world was going to hate them because their acceptance of Jesus' word showed that they did not belong to the world. His prayer was for the Father to protect them from the evil one. The word the disciples had accepted had set them apart or sanctified them. Their devotion was now to be to God alone. But the world would work not only to turn their attention away from God, but to cause division in the body of Christ. The attempt to silence the truth continued after Jesus' ascension into heaven, and it has continued into today. The unfortunate fact is that there has been compromise among those who have been called to be uncompromisingly focused on God. Many have tried to make Jesus more appealing. Jesus never did this. As Kyle Eidemann, who has written the book Not a Fan, explains, Jesus didn't sugarcoat his message. In fact, Kyle discovered that when Jesus had a large crowd, he would most often preach a message that was likely to lead them to leave him. One has to wonder, if a relationship with the Savior of the world isn't appealing enough to draw people to him, then what would be? It doesn't do anyone any good for believers to proclaim Christ Jesus if Jesus himself couldn't say amen to what they are proclaiming. The world needs to hear the real deal gospel. And potential followers of Jesus need to know the truth of what could be in store for them should they follow Jesus. Regardless of the cost to us, let's proclaim the truth that is God's word without compromise. Even though I pointed out yesterday that there has been much fracturing and division among Christians throughout the world, there is also good news. The walls of a d division are coming down. This is due to the fact that believers are recognizing that it is vastly more important to declare the kingdom of God than to embrace Christian denominations. When I felt compelled to attend the prayer meeting that was being held at Reliance Stadium in Houston on August 8, 2011, I went to gather with tens of thousands of others to meet with Jesus. There wasn't a Lutheran section or focus in that meeting, nor a Baptist section or focus in that meeting, nor a Pentecostal section or focus in that meeting, nor a Roman Catholic section or focus in that meeting, and I could go on and on. But you get the point. The prayer meeting was all about believers in Jesus 
coming to meet with Jesus. He was our focus, for he alone is our Lord and God and Savior. John chapter 18. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now we've got to stop right here, right now, to get the full effect of what we have just read and what the consequence was. Judas is guiding a band of soldiers. Following them were some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. These men were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. These men were men who were not easily frightened, or at least, at the very least, the detachment of soldiers, well, they weren't very easily frightened. However, when Jesus answers the question that he is the one they want, John writes that these men drew back and fell to the ground. What? Why would these men draw back and fall to the ground? Here is why. The answer is to be found in the original Greek, not in the English translation we are reading. You see, our translation has the words, I am he, coming from the lips of Jesus. However, what he said was, Ego, a me. Jesus had just said, I am. The I am had spoken, and the power of his name brought the results John has written down for us. The one who is I am spoke his name, and the men who had come to arrest him immediately drew back and fell down. Except for the fact that this is such a serious moment, I can't help but chuckle. The men had come with weapons, but the power of the name of God brought them down. Now, it could be that this is the first time that some of you have heard this. And I have to tell you the truth. It is new to me. It's a new revelation to me. And so since this may be a new revelation to many, let's hear how Linsky and Martin Luther explain what happens. Beginning in verse 4, we are told that Jesus went out to meet those who were being led by Judas to ask who they wanted. Their immediate reply was, Jesus of Nazareth. And so Jesus' immediate response was, Ego, a me, or I am. John writes as a side note that Judas was standing there with all those he had led to Jesus, but that when Jesus said, Ego, a me, or I am, they all went backward and fell down. Jesus' reply had an astonishing effect. The Greek text is clear. The men went back and they fell down. They shrank and retreated from Jesus who was facing them. Linsky writes, This cannot mean that only some of the men stumbled backward and fell. We might imagine it so, but John, who with his own eyes saw what happened, does not say this. Linsky continues, All the ancients regard this as a miraculous effect, and to this day many follow them. But others seek to explain what happened as a natural and psychological effect. They call to mind the miracles of Jesus, the belief of so many Jews in the divinity of Jesus, his grand entry into Jerusalem, and his second cleansing of the temple. They adduce a few similar instances from ancient history, and then they imagine that only a few men in the front ranks actually fell down. But when all is said that can be said, about the unexpectedness of Jesus' demand and answer and about the sudden panic this inspired, it fails to convince, granting even that only some fell prostrate. Here, however, everyone fell down as though struck by the word, a go, a me, or I am. They were given no time to think. They went backward. They went down completely. Linsky adds this quote by Martin Luther. He writes, Luther is right. John did not want this to be left unsaid in order that by means of the actual act he might indicate that with certainty who this person was. 
so that no one is to think that this is only a common man, but a person who with seven letters, a go, a me, or I am, he hurls them all back upon the ground, both the cohort and the servants of the high priest, including also Judas the traitor. This was a peculiar and divine power which Jesus intended to display, not only in order to frighten the Jews, but also to strengthen the disciples. For from this they could conclude, if the Lord did not voluntarily intend to give himself into death, he would have been well able to protect himself and to hinder his enemies, not needing other people's help, though the disciples dared to offer it. Very properly they should have thought, Lo, if this man can do this with a single word, which is not even a curse but a friendly answer, it surely must signify something exceptional that he so willingly yields himself and allows himself to be captured. He could defend himself, yet he does not do so, but he suffers. Therefore, the divine power, which he so often and now in the garden displays in one word, this power will not be able to allow itself much longer still to be restrained. His foes must go down, but he will rule. Wow! How awesome is that? Yes, Jesus could have defended himself without any problem whatsoever. He gave himself voluntarily over to suffering and death, and later on, when Pontius Pilate, who is convinced of Jesus' innocence, tells Jesus, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus' response is, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Jesus' suffering and death was God's plan and purpose all along, for this showed the love God had for the world he had made. Verse 7. Again, Jesus asked them, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. His ser the servant's name was Malchus. In light of the revelation we have just heard about concerning how Ego Emi put the soldiers the men of the chief priests and Pharisees and Judas Iscariot on the ground, I have got to wonder what Peter was thinking when he drew his sword and cut the high priest's servant's ear off. The name, Ego Emi, put these men on the ground, and Peter thinks, I'm going to protect you, Jesus? Really, Peter, come on. Verse 11. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? I've mentioned that the Gospel of John is quite different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the events leading up to Jesus' arrest give us some of those differences. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus goes with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to ask his Father if it would be possible for the cup Jesus is to drink, the cup of suffering, to be taken away from him. He asks in the Garden, could there be another way, Father? In the Gospel of John, however, Jesus does not pray for the cup of suffering and death to be removed from him, and he doesn't shed tears that were drops of blood. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is in absolute control of all that is going on around him. He in no way shrinks away from the suffering he will undergo. He displays his superior strength in the face of his enemies, and it is he who allows himself to be arrested by those who have no strength to match his might. Verse 12. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known by the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. Jesus had predicted that 
Peter would deny him not once or twice, but three times before the rooster crowed. This was the denial, his first denial, um, and Mr. I'm going to defend you, Jesus, with my little sword, isn't even able to stand up to the question of a, of a girl. Naturally, we are going to hear how Peter will deny Jesus two more times, but rather than criticize Peter for his cowardliness, let's jump forward to see the difference the anointing of the Holy Spirit will make in him. When Peter was anointed with the Holy Spirit, he becomes fearless. Reading selected passages from Acts 2, we have these words. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. And Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what must we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all who call on the name of our Lord will be saved. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Peter didn't know it at the time when he was denying Jesus, but he would become Peter the Rock when the Spirit of Truth came upon him. Verse 18, it was cold, and the servants and officials stood around the fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded. 
If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Jesus' prediction concerning Peter's denials had now been fulfilled. Verse 28. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning. And to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. Well, isn't the hypocrisy here rather amazing? Now, I realize that all of this is to fulfill the scriptures which had been spoken about Jesus. But what in the world were these people thinking? They had premeditated the arrest of Jesus. They had premeditated their plots and plans against him in order to murder him which would make them guilty of murder, but they would not enter into the palace of the Roman governor because they didn't want to become ceremonially unclean. All of this sin they were committing was terrible. What were they thinking? They were thinking something like, well, let's be sure to stay ceremonially clean so we can eat the Passover and thereby show ourselves to be in covenant with God. Really. Hypocrisy truly blinds those affected by it. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Jesus' accusers would not answer Pilate. They had no charge against him except that Jesus said he was the Son of God. For them, this was blasphemy. But this charge wouldn't have gotten them anywhere with Pilate because Pilate was a Gentile. Pilate saw through them. He knew Jesus wasn't guilty. So Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Jesus' accusers had their hands tied by Roman law. Only Pilate could follow through with the execution of Jesus. So had their hands not been tied, however... The typical Jewish execution would have been by stoning. But this was not the death Jesus would die. He would suffer the death God had foreordained. Jesus would die by crucifixion, the form of execution used by the Romans for slaves and traitors and the worst type of criminal. Verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Though we are not told how Pilate came to ask Jesus this particular question, Jesus comes back with his own question. Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your own people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Now, there are only two occasions in the Gospels when Jesus is referred to as the King of the Jews. The first occasion is when the Magi from the East come to Jerusalem. This is recorded in Matthew's Gospel. And they're coming in search of the one who had been born King of the Jews. And the second time Jesus is referred to as the King of the Jews is when he is standing before Pilate. Well, now, Jesus never refers to himself as king of the Jews because his kingdom is not of this world. Yes, Jesus is most certainly a king, but not as some thought he was king. Having heard Jesus say, my kingdom is from another place, Pilate responds by saying, you are a king then. To this question, Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate answered. It really is too bad. 
that Pilate didn't realize that the one who is truth was standing right in front of him. Too bad Pilate didn't realize that through Jesus he had the way he could have come to the Heavenly Father. Having asked the question, what is truth, Pilate went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. That is where we are going to stop today. And let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks and praise for your word. We thank you that no matter how many times we open it up, no matter how many times we study it, there is still more for us to learn. We thank you, O oh Lord, for insight and revelation into your word. We thank you for the truth that just keeps you know, being revealed to us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for what you are doing among us. Thank you for what you are doing in our hearts. Lord, we pray that we would be proclaimers of your truth. We pray that when pressed, we would not deny you, but we would say, yes, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is my Savior. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for sending your Son into the world. Without him, there would be no hope for us. But you provided a Savior. Thank you, O Lord, for all you are doing among us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless us and keep us as only you can. Protect us by that powerful name of Jesus. In the troubles of our life, protect us by the powerful name of Jesus. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that, that, that simple name, the powerful name of Jesus, and the expression of your name, Ego, Amy, I am, Yahweh, is able to fell all of your enemies. So we thank you for that. Heavenly Father, I now bless these people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye until next time. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.